Thousands of people fled from the enslaved areas of Texas and Louisiana to Mexico. The Rio Grande among the enslaved people was known as the River of Deliverance. We're going to talk about Juneteenth and the connection with Mexico. But first, this is Latina Literati. If you enjoy amazing stories, wonderful people from past and present, and great books, then this is the channel for you. So let's hop right into it. Mexico is the nation that is next to the United States to the south, and it was once made up of everything that we know, almost from Canada, from about Oregon, all the way down to what is now Central America. And Mexico had a very important role to play, not just in the coming about of the Civil War, but also in giving a beacon of freedom, being a place where the enslaved people could escape bondage. Mexico, in its constitution, would abolish slavery 50 years before the United States. And it was one of the reasons why people in Texas would rise up. But let's start, as always, from the beginning. When Spain invades and conquers Mexico. And let's not forget, the only reason Spain is able to do that is because it is able to divide and conquer. It allies itself with some of the groups of indigenous people that did not want to be under the Aztec Empire. And so together, they are able to eventually defeat and conquer the indigenous people that made what is now Mexico their home. Immediately, the Spanish enslave the indigenous people. There are some that are able to hold out, but slavery exists in Mexico from the very beginning. In the United States, we know that 1619, and I will link below the 1619 project, which is a fabulous trove of important information. 1619 is the date when the first ship of enslaved people arrives in North America, but in Mexico, it was much before that. Heading south to Liberty, south to Mexico from Texas, Louisiana, was a lot easier, was a lot closer than trying to head north past the Mason-Dixon line or even farther north to Canada. Although hundreds of thousands of enslaved people went north, tens of thousands went south. We don't know the exact numbers, but we do know that as soon as they crossed the Rio Grande, not only Mexican officials, but the Mexican people defended them. And it's important to recognize and acknowledge this safe haven for the enslaved people. It really begins with the Trail of Tears when the Seminole Indians from Georgia, some from Florida, had joined with some enslaved people. There were mixed families, and they are forced out of their traditional lands as the colonies start pushing them and different laws against Indians having any land and, of course, having anything to do with enslaved people who had run away. And so there are generations of people that find their way to Mexico knowing that there they will be safe. But why is Mexico a safe haven? Why does Mexico take up the beacon of liberty? Why does Mexico say, this is where slavery ends? We need to begin with Haiti. Haiti is the first nation in this hemisphere that abolishes slavery. Haiti gains its independence from France Toussaint La Vauture, the great general and national hero, national Haitian hero, writes the Constitution of 1801 and says, slavery is hereby abolished. And this comes to be known as the freedom principle. And so Haiti is the first nation on earth, modern nation, that says slavery is abolished forever here. So Haiti is the example, Haiti is a beacon, and Haiti has paid a very dear price for that. We've said it before in other videos and it's important to repeat. Haiti paid a terrible blood price 
and France extracted from Haiti billions of dollars financed by U.S. banks as a freedom charge. They had to pay reparations to the French for the loss of their golden goose for the most valuable colony of the French, the colony that made the most money for French slaveholders and other business holders. This is really important. Haiti is at the heart of the march towards freedom. It begins at Haiti and it ends many, many years later with the ratification of the 13th Amendment, but we'll get there. So Mexico recognizes that Spain enslaved all of the indigenous people and it wants to distance itself from slave holding Spain because even after Mexico wins its independence in the early 1800s, Spain still has Caribbean possessions and Spain continues to allow slavery in Cuba. After Mexico gains its freedom from Spain, it wants to distance itself from Spain and there is a very close tie in the mind of most Mexicans of slavery and colonialism. Anti-slavery is to be anti-colonialist and to be pro-Mexican. Mexicans are incredibly proud of their nation and to be Mexican meant also to be anti-slavery. They are not like the Spanish that continue to allow slavery in their possessions. And they also want to differentiate themselves from their northern neighbors. Because in the north, a lot of suffering during the whole period of chattel slavery, and Mexico wants nothing to do with it. Mexico in 1921 abolishes any racial categories. Let me repeat that. As soon as Mexico is gaining its independence, one of the first things it does is abolish racial categories. And that's really hard to understand coming from a place where we're asked to check a box on every single form. What are you? What are you? What are you? What are you? And in all honesty, for most Latinas, there isn't a box for us. Are we indigenous? Yes, we may have indigenous blood. Are we white? Not really. Are we black? Not really. We are a beautiful mixture of many, many things. Are we Asian? We probably have some A positive blood, <laughs> but again, there isn't a box that reflects us. And so I've had this discussion many, many times with many people. Why do we have to fit into a box? What does it matter? So Mexico does away with slavery, but it comes under huge pressure from the people who have invaded the northern area of Coahuila, known as Texas, and they are slaveholders. And they're coming from the part of the colonies that are slave states. They invade Texas under the pretext of wanting to just borrow the land to graze their cattle grow some cotton, but their numbers are growing and they're putting a lot of pressure on the Mexican government because of course they're slaveholders. Also the sugar plantations in the area of Veracruz are putting a lot of pressure on the new government in Mexico and so they actually reverse their complete ban on slavery and allow those areas to continue to have slavery. So this is huge, this is kind of a step backwards, but it won't last for long. So 1830, Article 10 specifically bans slavery. And so what people in Texas do is they make everybody sign a document with a cross because you remember it was against the law to teach enslaved people to read and write. So they just put a cross for their name saying that they were indentured servants for 99 years, far longer than they would be expected to live under the harsh conditions under which they were treated. And so the Mexican government then says, no, there can be no indentured contract, no indentured service for longer than 10 years. And that does away with that loophole. And guess what happens? The Texas slaveholders revolt and all of a sudden they want to establish the Texas Republic. Not because they cared about anything. They just wanted their economic interests protected and they were being threatened by the Mexican laws that said no more slavery. So this is really nuanced. This is really important to understand. There are a lot of layers here. So you already have people invading territory that is Mexican territory. It's being used. They're being allowed to you know, use it. And then there is a time when they say no more, no more immigrants from the slaveholding states or anywhere else in, in this fledgling country that has uh, slavery. And you know what the colonists did? They ignored Mexican laws and they crossed the border into Mexico because they wanted to live in Mexico. Isn't that interesting? Let's repeat that. So U.S. people from the fledgling United States would cross into Mexico. They wanted to live in Mexico and they didn't care 
that Mexico had banned immigration from those original colonies. Isn't that interesting? And were they put in detention? Did they have family separations? Were they attacked? Were they whipped on horseback? No. The Mexicans let them alone. What a very different treatment, right? Really shows you the soul of the people. That's all I have to say. <laughs> but let's continue on our story. So 1836, you have the slaveholder revolt in Texas and it becomes the Texas Republic. So again, remember, even the Northern states that did not permit slavery had fugitive slavery laws, as did Canada. That meant that if someone had been enslaved and they got to those areas and people who used to own them found them, they could be brought back. Very, very different than Mexico. The minute you touched Mexican territory, you were free. You actually could become a Mexican citizen and no one could come and get you. No one could kidnap you. And that's what they were called. They were called the white kidnappers because they would come down, the slave patrols, etc., would go into Mexican territory and the Mexican people and the Mexican officials would fight them. There were many battles in towns where they were trying to kidnap people to take them back into bondage, back into slavery, and the people said no. They are our neighbors, they live with us, there is no way we're gonna let you take them back to that cruel condition. It's really important to understand how incredibly welcoming Mexico has been. Another reason why Mexico was so anti-slavery is that it really boosted international support for Mexico as a nation. Remember, Mexico is a fledgling nation. It has just fought off two of the greatest armies and powers. It fought off Spain and then France tried to invade and it's fought off. Now it's got this northern neighbor that is menacing and the most likely to annex Texas. And so it really wants international support and it gains it by having the higher moral ground, by saying we will embody the freedom principle. First established in the Haitian constitution, Mexico will also embody this freedom principle. All people are equal. What a beautiful phrase. Everyone is equal. Doesn't matter what you look like, everyone is equal very simple phrase and one that will be the basis of the treatment of those who make it to Mexican territory. So this is enshrined in the Mexican Constitution of 1857. 1801, Toussaint Lavoture enshrines in the Haitian Constitution, slavery is abolished forever here. Ratification of the 13th Amendment doesn't happen until December 1965. So it's like 64 years have to go by before the U.S. catches up to Haiti. Morally, maybe it never catches up. <laughs> and so the two parts of the 1857 Constitution are one, all slavery is banned, and it also bans the return of anyone who may have been enslaved to the person who said that they had owned them. So it does both things in the Mexican Constitution. Huge, huge, huge for those trying to seek freedom from bondage, crossing the Rio Grande, the river of deliverance. And all of this pressure, the ability of people to reach freedom in the South and the ability of people to reach freedom in the North, all of this is putting a lot of pressure on the slave states, obviously. And in 1861, the U.S. Civil War begins, which will, of course, as we know, be the end of slavery in the United States, at least on paper because the 13th Amendment does have one exception, and it's for incarcerated people. People who are incarcerated continue to labor, and we know because of the unjust laws and the unjust processes that brown and black people are more likely to be incarcerated, and they are treated as slaves. They work for almost no wages and have almost no rights. And so that it is the next frontier of ending slavery is the abolition of the current system. There's another little war that takes place here, of course, the U.S annexes Texas, invades Mexico in 1846, and from 1846 to 1848, fights the Mexican army, and the United States is getting help from France. It's not a fair fight, and it's not a right fight. You don't get to just walk into someone else's home and say, I'm taking half your house, and that's exactly what happened. And the U.S. then will take half of the Mexican territory, and under the Treaty of Guadalupe, both cultural and linguistic rights of the people who live in these areas of the entire southern United States are to be respected. Treaties are the highest law of the land. You can't 
legislate against treaties once you sign a treaty. States can't make laws against treaties. Arizona, for example, their anti-immigrant law, their anti-Latina, Latina, Hispanic, whatever you want to call it laws, all of them are in violation of that treaty. I think it's important to say it. So 180 years ago, all of Southern United States is part of Mexico. It's only been annexed by the United States for the last 180 years. That is nothing in the span of time that our people have lived in these lands. Remember, our indigenous ancestors have been here for 10, 15, thousand years. So when people talk about immigrants and they talk about newcomers, they're definitely not talking about us. <laughs> and even if they were, everyone should be welcome. You have a right to be free and you have a right to be here. Free movement of goods and people, right? A hundred years later, actually 200 years later, in 2020, for the first time, people in Mexico in the census are asked whether they belong to a group that they now want to recognize as Afro-Mexicans. Even the way that question is phrased in the census form is so different from the way that we're asked to check boxes here. It says, by your traditions and your customs, do you consider yourself Afro-Mexican, Black, or of African descent? Really interesting, very different than the way we're asked questions on our forms. So in the states of Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Veracruz, approximately about 5% of the population identifies as Afro-Mexican. That's not insignificant at all, and I think it surprised a lot of people. There is a beautiful Juneteenth celebration right across the border in Mexico. There's a place called Nacimiento de Negros in Coahuila, which means the place where Blacks are born. And I think it's a place where maybe they were reborn into freedom. And so on Juneteenth, there will be writers riding these races uh, from one town to another, and they're going to have a huge barbecue with all sorts of traditional foods that are not Mexican. They are foods that were brought by the enslaved people, things like cornbread. As you know, in Mexico, tortillas are eaten, not cornbread. So it's quite interesting that this group survived so close to the U.S. and thrived and continues to celebrate Juneteenth. So I'll link a story about that because I think that's just fabulous. So now for my favorite part of the video, the book recommendations. And there are several books on this topic, but I think the one that best focuses on the historical process and nuances is Baumgartner's South to Freedom. There are some things that are a little, how can I put this, a little jarring when you read them. For example, her use of the word masters or some of the details of women's work. But all in all, it's, it really is worth reading. She did a lot of work on both sides of the border, which is uncommon. She went to archives in Mexico and actually found stories of formerly enslaved people who had lived in Mexico and, and what their stories are. So I think it's really a good place to start if you'd like to learn more about this topic. I think we're gonna learn a lot more about it in the future. I think we're just starting to touch the surface, the tip of the iceberg of so much information on this, what it means to be Afro-Mexican. So thank you so much for joining us on this journey. It's a joint journey. I would love to hear what you think on this topic and what you're reading this summer. There are a lot of things that we'd like to talk to you about, but we'd love to hear any suggestions that you may have. We would love you to subscribe to Latina Literati. And as always, we wish you mucho cariño, mucho salud y mucho amor. Gracias.